Um, I'm going to tell you a story first. Five years ago, uh, on a Saturday morning in the spring, uh, I was in Long Island with my wife and my little daughter. She was about 10 years old, and um, we were stuck in traffic, and I made, um, I was taking a shortcut through a strip mall. And as soon as I turned, I didn't tell my, my wife and my daughter I was gonna turn, but as soon as I turned, um, my wife was yelling out, wrong turn. And I thought I turned into a one-way street, but in fact, she said wrong turn because immediately I recognized why it was a wrong turn. We were in front of a pet store, and the pet store had 25 cages with little kittens outside. My daughter in the back seat, she jumped up almost through the convertible roof. She started yelling and she squeezed out of the car and she was running around those cages. And which one do I pick? Which one do I pick? And my wife and I were looking at each other. She said, I will never forgive you. This is so wrong. We, and we, we said, you can't have a kitten. My wife has two dogs, right? You can't have a kitten. Um, she started, you know, a 10-year-old girl, she's like my third child, she's my baby. She started crying, really, really dissolving. Um, and I felt bad, my wife felt bad, but we somehow squeezed her back into the car, we drove off. She was crying until she fell asleep on the way back. In the afternoon, I had to bring my car to uh, the dealership for an inspection. And um, don't ask me how it happened, but uh, within the next two hours while I was waiting for the inspection, I actually bought a new car. Those dealerships, right? So I bought a new car, but a really hot, a $100,000 convertible car. I, I can't name any names, but it rhymes with Shersedes. Um, and uh, it had, uh, you know, the, the roof came down, 300 and some horsepower. And my wife didn't know about this. So, this is, uh, so uh, my wife is still in, a, in uh, Long Island again, buying something from Ikea. And I call her up, and I just want to, you know, show off my car. But I don't want to tell her that I have a new car. So I, um, I uh, say to her, do you need help? Um, and she said, you know, for a fact, my SUV is so full with IKEA furniture. If you are in the neighborhood, why don't you come and pick up Melanie? Because uh, I, I can't fit her in the car anymore. I'm like, perfect. So I'm going over there, not telling them about the car. It had a different color, right? So I'm going through the parking lot trying to find them. And we're on the phone. And I'm like, where are you? And she's like, where are you? I can't see your car. I'm like, well, it's, it's not the same color. It's silver now. And she's like, are you kidding me? Did you just buy this? What is wrong with you? And I'm like, well, you know, midlife crisis. And um, my daughter is speechless. She's looking at the car. And I'm like, get in. And it's not that hot yet, but we take the roof down anyway, right? And now we have the full wind in her hair, and she's sitting there. If you're driving behind my wife, and we let her get ahead a little bit, and then uh, at a moment, I floor the car, right? She gets squeezed into the seat, her hair is flying, and she yells out, this is so much better than a kitten. <laughs> So for the last five years, and you know, if she's watching now, she's gonna hate me for this, but we tease the ones we love. <laughs> um, for the next five years, this was the joke in the family, right? Whenever she liked something, we would say, is this better than a kitten? Now, I told you this story because now I need to tell you that second story. I told you this story because when I was a, when I was younger, like a couple of days ago, um, when I was not yet 27, um, I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be a guitar player in a rock band. And um, I was unfortunate that Bruce Springsteen, who is also five feet four, already occupied that spot. 
So I went into academia to produce myself. And guess what? This is so much better than being a rock star. So that's my introduction this morning. <laughs> I will not play. This was just to tell you the story. Uh, this is special. Uh, by the way, we have a very large audience around the world right now because we are live streaming. And so we know that, uh, for example, Christina Pacheco is watching us somewhere in, in uh, Malaysia, I think. Um, so people around the world, we, we are a global program. So this is being also recorded. It will be available um, on our website, on YouTube, I suppose. Um, just to put you into the, the mood here, right? The weather, the weather here in New York is working a little bit against us. This is a very special day, but before I go on and say anything about what we will do, it's very important to me. Um, I need to put the credits first. Uh, I'm not going to do them at the end where everybody's tired leaving the credits first. Uh, there's some very special people in the room. The first thing is, Jessica, can you come up? Because I need to show them something. Jessica Metz, who is more or less co-directing the program with me. Um, very important person. All this uh, would not be possible without her. Yeah, come on up. Um, I need to show you this. So as soon as Jessica and I are like anywhere close like this, it, it happens. We are attached by the hip. We are, we, are, we are attached at the hip. So just wanted to show them if we are attached at the hip. <laughs> um, Rhea is here, Jerome is here, Raz is here, Robert is here, faculty, uh, and then Joseph Press is also here. We flew him in, we fl flew him in from Zurich. He will be uh, the keynote speaker later on after lunch. Um, very important people, Rhea, thank you for and Jerome, thank you for the video. Jerome, by the way, you saw him in the video. He's also here. You can like touch him. He's he's real. <laughs> uh, all this would not have been possible without the people that are here today. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll collect some more people as the day goes on. Uh, here's what we are doing. Th this is a very special occasion because this is our first inaugural uh, conference. Because we are graduating the first cohort in a few weeks, um, that started two years ago, that went through the program. Um, we are now in the third intake, and we will be joined by another 150 students this, this fall, and we will have grown to a program of 200 people. And the growth was, uh, to, to get the growth was not very hard because we designed something that's very unique and very powerful. We, we, fused, we fused and infused business logic, economic rationality, and organizational reality with business thinking. And it became design intelligence. I'm sorry, with business thinking, with design thinking. And it became design intelligence. And we think that design intelligence is special because it's imperative. You have to do it. Um, design before strategy and before management. We pride ourselves on the methods being collaborative. This is how things happen. And you will get a little taste of it in the next segment. And you will also get a little taste of it this afternoon. As much as we can provide to show you what we mean by collaborative. You know, there's a big difference between collaborative and group projects, right? Just remember when you were assigned a group project last time and said, no, again. Versus collaboration is, is as you will see from the people that we will feature here today, is very, very different. Um, and also, on the outcome, this is a different discipline that we are trying to establish here. It's transformative. This is not transactional learning. You are not purchasing and consuming education. You are co-producing the program and yourself um, for 
two years in its current format. Um, the people that I will show you in a few minutes, and when we talk, you will see that those people uh, are, I will, I will show you that they are very different from where they were two years ago. Um, so that's, that's what we do here, this fusion paradigm of business and design. And the background is our very successful undergraduate program where we have a BBA in strategic design management uh, where I taught for 10 years before getting the opportunity and the, and the privilege to direct this program. Uh, by the way, my name is JJ. Um, that's much more branded than Dr. Jelen, right? So um, when you interact with me, JJ is perfect. Um, so last fall semester, I taught a course in the program. Um, it was the first time we taught this course. It was qualitative research. Uh, qualitative research is between studio one, where people learn how to work with a outside partner, and studio two, where they want to produce their own aspirations into a business model, into a possible venture, into a socially responsible model. And um, uh, we got a lot of mixed reactions before people studied qualitative research methods, because research, it's a, it's a strong word and, and numbers and uh, what will happen. It turned out to be one of the best courses in my life because it was online and I spent my Sunday mornings essentially either in a room with Monica Izasa, who uh, works and lives in Rome, or in Abu Dhabi with Alia Al Noaimi, who lives in Abu Dhabi, or in New York with Market Andrew. <laughs> um, oh, Mark was uh, Robert's student. Uh, I had Andrew in my class, and. If I'm featuring those four, it's not to say that the other 26 MS students from the, um, from the program are not as outstanding as those four, but those four managed something that is pretty rare. They managed to get my attention. I'm a very busy and virtual person, and to get my attention requires some really interesting skills. So that's their advantage. But they are just representative of the quality of people that, that we produce. We, we then wrote four papers, and three of those papers will be presented at the DMI conference um, in London in September. So what we will do with you is we will not do paper presentations, right? You did not waste your Saturday morning to hear yet another paper presentation and look at another 57 PowerPoint slides, we will have a conversation about the ontology, why did those people get here, the androgyny, which is, the, I'm sorry, the, yeah, which is the adult pedagogy, and uh, the outcomes of the research. What did they research and uh, why they were motivated, motivated by this research? So uh, here's what uh, I will do. I will call those people out. I will say a few words about them, but I want them to talk about themselves in, in a few minutes. I will tell you some dark secrets about them. Um, so first I'm gonna call Monica. Monica, come on up. So Monica is um, Colombian American French, um, works in Rome, I think, Speaking five languages, having three passports, she is, and working for the State Department. What does that tell you? She's a spy, right? Um, that's a dark secret. Um, also, she's the only Colombian I know that doesn't like coffee. How is that possible, right? She caught my attention. What I'm not supposed to say that she's Shakira's little sister, so I never said that, right? She doesn't want me to say that. Monica worked on researching the maker movement. She went around in Rome and she talked endlessly to makers, handcrafters, and 
what we can do to design a new context for them to be more successful than just selling the stuff in the street. Um, very interesting paper. I learned so much. Um, so, Monica Zaza from Columbia. Next, um, Andrew Hutton. Andrew. Now, Andrew, let me just say this. He works for a very important consulting company that, again, I can't name any names, so it just rhymes with Percenture. <laughs> um, Andrew came to me before the program and said, this is my dream job, and now Andrew is in his dream job. It helps to be good looking, right? <laughs> Andrew, we'll, we'll talk. Uh, Aliyah, come on out. Aliyah from Abu Dhabi. We flew her in, she's staying here for a month. Um, now, here's what's special about Aliyah. I had her several years ago in an undergraduate class. And uh, she was a excellent student then, and she's outshining herself again now that she's in the master's program. And you wouldn't think that she actually got her education in France when you hear her talk because her accent is so wonderfully British. <laughs> and finally, Mark. Now, Mark comes to us from a very, very remote place called Texas. <laughs> he doesn't have a southern draw. He can do one, but he doesn't. Oh, yeah. You're from, did you say Austin or San Antonio? San Antonio, Texas, right? But he's, he lives in New York. Mark's dark secret is, why is that guy calmer than me every time? Look at him, nothing can disturb Mark. So, those four stood out, they got my attention. We wrote papers together, or in the case of Mark, he was working with Robert Levitt because he's on site. We did online, and we realized that we didn't work together online. We have a new word for our mode of online, it's called away, because it's not really online learning. When I'm Skyping with Monica in, in uh, Rome, it's nothing about online learning. For two hours, we're just going back and forth, and she's taking notes, and I'm having ideas. That's not my understanding of online learning. What I didn't have her do is show up with certain remarks in the discussion forum, right? So we want to talk about all this uh, in the next few minutes. And I need to step back. I could talk for three hours without break, as you realize. So I need them to talk about who they are, why they got here in the first place, and after having done this research, what are they doing with it and where they go next, right? So we're going to do that um, in a conversation, and then we will invite you towards the end of the morning session if you have a few questions about things that they said. Um, there's one mic here, and then I'm going to give up my mic. And we will take your questions and see what they have to say. Sound good? So those guys are terribly nervous because they don't know how I'm going to ask the questions. They've been preparing left and right, up and down, and they know me that I always have these stupid tricks, right? Like bringing a freaking guitar, right? That arrived in time. I, I, I don't, I used to know how to play. I haven't played in years, but I'm starting again. That's why I got the guitar and I thought, how fortunate it was delivered to my house the day before yesterday. Somehow it's, it's gonna find its way in the show, right? Um, so, Monica, I think the, the mic is on. Hello? Yes. Someone tell us, see, see, she has to tell us a little bit about herself because this is, Monica, who came to me two years ago, she was passing to New York, and she came to me in my office um, trying to check out, get more information about the program, check out the program, and 
we were talking, I was, I was hurrying, I was in, I did, never took off my jacket or coat, whatever I had, right? And it was in the, in my dean's conference room, um, people were coming in and out and we were sitting there and Monica's, Monica's attitude was like, what is this all about? Now, when she talks, I want you to watch something that's, that's very special about Monica. She actually makes more movements with her face muscles than she words. Then she, then she speaks words. Very, very interesting. And here she is today, and you love it, right? Yeah, love it. How'd you get here? So, um, I'm Colombian, and how I got here today on this stage is because um, I grew up being around an artisanal culture. Um, we always would eat soup, um, the soup, um, Colombian soup called Sancocho, that we always ate in this black ceramic. And um, which has been really interesting because now they became quite popular um, here in the States and Europe. Um, and so I was always surrounded by this. I would go to markets. We always had artisanal markets and I would always have my little mochila since I was a little kid and it was just a part of me. And then uh, when I was um, in school also, um, when I went to first or kindergarten, my mom put me in a Waldorf school. So that experience also touched me very much and made me really in touch with my hands and with appreciating um, how things are made by hand because, for example, one story I remember is um, when I learned to write, I didn't, they didn't just give me a pen and made me start writing, but we went through a whole process and I wrote with a little fat crayon with a skinnier one and then we got a piece of bamboo and we cut it and we made the first pen that we would write with, like an ink pen. And then from there, we moved to the real ink pen. So I really learned to appreciate what it takes to make something. And the notebooks was the same when we had, a, it was by like season. So if it was math season, we would make our notebook. We would draw the picture. So the school really encouraged us to work with our hands. We had ceramics, sewing, um, knitting, all kinds of things like that, boys and girls, so we all kind of learned from a really early age to make things with our hands, and then um, I was fortunate that I'd been moving around a lot for years. Um, I moved to the States, and then I started traveling. And uh, the first time that I really had a really out-of-body traveling experience is when I went to Bangladesh to do the Peace Corps, and I got there, and. I said, holy shit, I don't think I can stay here. This is really intense. Like everything was just the, the smells, the colors, the heat, the people. Like it was just so overwhelming. And I said, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay here for two years. But then I guess when you're in a really difficult situation, you always have to see the positive. And um, I started seeing, well, what is it that is beautiful about this place? There has to be something. And then I really started getting into the crafts as I'm always like, you know, connected to this since I was a little child. So I started looking. And when we got there, we we're supposed to be community um, development volunteers. But what, what happened when we actually got there, they wanted us to teach English. And I'm a little bit rebellious. I said, no, I'm not going to teach English. I don't like that. Let me figure out what I can do. So then I went and started learning how to dye fabrics with different techniques from South Asia. I learned to block print and do batik and do Japanese tie dye with another volunteer that I met there. And then I said, okay, I went to the director of our program. I said, okay, this is what I want to do. I'm going to teach women in the community where you sent me how to do this so they can make clothing and pillow covers or things for the house and sell them and make money. How did you end up in the State Department in Rome? <laughs> this is well, still 180,000 miles away from that. Yeah, no, because it's all serendipitous. So when I was there, you know, we, we kind of got adopted by families from the State Department because we were in austere conditions. So once in a while we get a treat and we got to come to DACA and these people took us in and... Uh, so I started making relationships with these people, and I'm like, okay, maybe this is a possibility, but, but how I actually got into it is um, because I, I fell in love with a French man that took me to France where I couldn't work, so then I started applying to all kinds of jobs, and I remember, oh, the State Department, and then at that moment, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to see if 
if they send me to a place where I want to go, I'm going to do it. And I really wanted to go to China, and they sent me to China. So that's how it all started. Well, okay, so you end up at the State Department because you fell in love with a Frenchman. Did you get into my program because you <laughs> fell in love with me? Not quite. <laughs> what was the decisive moment? Tell us. So I did this for a few years, and it was quite separated from my passion. You know, it's a very bureaucratic job um, surrounded by people that are quite stiff and square, and I was sitting in this desk with distance to this computer, and I started looking at the screen, trying to like write this paper over and over, watching for a comma, watching for a space, watching for this, and then I said, that's it. Like I can't do this. I need to change my life. So I started looking for programs, and uh, I decided to come to New York to do a, a Parsons summer program on strategic design with other teachers, and then at that moment, that's when I walked into your office and said, tell me what this is about. I just want to clarify that the summer program, it was not with me, so she somehow made the decision independently, right? I had nothing to do with it. No. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't your charm that got me in it. Andrew, um, is your story just as exciting? What's the not woman nearly. that you fell in love with? <laughs> but I can tell you I enjoy the spacing and the commas and the, that just, just word processing gets me going. Um, no, actually, I feel um, I come from another side of the spectrum in a sense of, um, and that's actually how I frame the, the program in general, in that there's, there's very tactile people, like Monica and how she grew up, and designers are over here on this one end of the spectrum, you know, true practicing designers. And then, um, and then there's the theory, and then there's us maybe in the middle. Then there's maybe creative business folks, and then there's the consultants like myself. And then there's academics way over here doing these social sciences and doing these um, typical liberal arts. And um, so that's where I come from, way over here. But actually, the, the fantastic part about this program and that um, I think everyone else will highlight and say in um, much more detail is that being over here or over here, um, the program not only accepts all types in that sense, um, but celebrates it. And so that, that perspective is just I've brought it into the program, and it's you've been pushing us to just be how we are and do this new thing with wholly new inputs. And, and when was that that moment when you decided you were going to submit yourself to my will? <laughs> what what happened there? I was on. Um, because I remember you coming to my office, and you kind of told he didn't let me talk. Right? You you will notice he <laughs> right he's perfect for the job that he's in. Um, he's just. He sat down and he said, John, this is what's going to happen with me. <laughs> well, no, it's totally uh, not exactly how it went. Um, well, <laughs> I will. That's how you see it. You right? also thought you were crazy, huh? Let me, let me step a little farther back, back because um, cause it's important. So, so this side of things, um, this, this, this kind of framework driven, this, this systems thinking that's kind of high level that doesn't, it jives, but it's not kind of the core of what. Um, design, at least I would have thought it was, um, back when I had no idea what design was. But, um, but out of undergrad, um, I found a way to use this crazy thinking, and that was I was going to go to law school. I was going to go be a lawyer. I was going to um, use this, this mental prowess that I had built up and then craft these arguments. And um, it was in a constitutional law class as an undergrad um, that we, uh, second day of class, not the first day, the second day of class with our first set of readings of our first set of um, cases that we just got thrown up in front and said, all right, plaintiff's attorney, defendant attorney, rehash out these cases, these landmark cases of American constitutional history, Marbury v. Madison, uh, Givens v. Ogden, um, just all of them, Brown v. Board. So enlightening, um, inspiring, um, we're building these arguments. It, it was like a hit you know, over my head of I'm, I'm making something. And it was the way that I was actually good at making things, which was on a screen with typing and commas and such, um, and arguments. Um, but kind of came crashing down after I spent an entire year uh, in the real world, working for a law firm, seeing the actual um, way the sausage gets made. Because creative lawyering is actually illegal, right? Like it's just not existence. <laughs> it was probably stamped out like 80 years ago. Um, and we spent all the time just replies, responses, continuations, extensions. Just um, like Monica. 
she was probably in something similar. It's the government. Um, and it was just, it was just zero sum. It was just not a way to actually have a creative output, although, man, they deceived me in that constitutional law class. Um, so a year of this, um, I was gonna go to Cardozo, I was in, they'd given me money, I was like about to go, and I was like, I can't pull this trigger. Um, and that was like the change of heart that led to the soul searching. Um, I, it, was, it was a 180 degree shift, I, I, that's how I conceive it of, of this law thing to this business thing. And um, like John says, I was like, all right, that's consulting, that's, the, that's how the fun guys do it. Th those are the, the top-notch guys who do, who do business, the, the, the crack team. Um, but then I, was, I, I had to go back and think to myself, who makes stuff? You know, that was what drew me to this law thing, that's what drew me to any of the other things that I enjoyed in life, was like I was creative, I could make things. Um, and I, this was two and a half years ago before this program, and I had the simple answer of, it's these designers. I like, started doing the search for consultancies and IDEO kind of was down there, and I was just, you know, do dove in, intrigued, and walked into John's office. That conversation probably happened a week before I, before our program started, two years and three months ago. And, um, and two out of four, I want to uh, point out, both came to the program out of this early midlife crisis. I need to do something else. Uh, they were all... We call that a quarter-life crisis. You call it what? Millennials call that a quarter-life crisis. Right, quarter-life, right. We're all right, in right, it. We're all right. in right. it. I'm sorry, I don't relate to that part. Uh, <laughs> but but two, or, two out of four, they uh, also connect connected to me very well because I sympathize with him. I'm a lawyer, right, originally. And yeah, that's what you think. <laughs> that's what I think, right. Um, and then with, with, with Monica, I also have uh, speak five languages and have two passports. I'm sorry, you have three passports, right? So we, we already have this connection somewhere uh, along the line. And what was the life-changing moment in your uh, uh, career, Alia? Uh, you are a real estate mogul out there in Abu Dhabi, and here you are. Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> um, I think I had two turning points um, in my life that led me here, and it was quite serendipitous, like um, I think everyone here. It happened very naturally and organically. Um, I'm from Abu Dhabi in the UAE, and I went to French school my entire life. And when I graduated, I went to Sciences Po in France, and on our first day, the, a very serious guy was giving a speech to welcome us, and he said, we're going to break you and mold you the Sciences Po way. I left before the end of the year. Um, after that, I joined the design management program at Parsons and... The undergrad. The undergrad. Right. And graduated from here. And I moved back home. And the first thing my father said to me was, this is great, um, but nobody's going to speak your language. And he was right. I started looking for a job, and I got a job on the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi project um, after five interviews, during one of which um, someone quite senior said to me, we don't know where to place you. Welcome and to strategic design management. <laughs> Create, create your own job. Exactly, exactly. And um, so after that, I started the job, I was excited. I walked into a room um, with gray cubicles, boring posters, and grim expressions. Um, six months later, I was typing my resignation letter, and um, I had already started the program at this point, and I remember saying to my sister, Shada, who's actually here, um, this is my thing. Uh, I'm a design strategist. And I had a job description, but no job to go with it yet. Super. Another crisis turning into something positive. We will have to talk about that. What am I attracting here? Um, Mark, <laughs> tell us. Tell us the story from San Antonio to New York. The interesting thing about me is that the only thing certain about me is uncertainty. I've been always uncertain about what I want to do, how to get there, and then what to do with it. 
and it ends up that I found a practice that utilizes that in itself to create value. I come from San Antonio, which is a, a melting pot of different cultures, of a uh, big Hispanic culture that's very assimilated into American culture that has a mixture of language and culture and, and, and customs and rituals that, that work together, right? And I come, I went to Boston for an undergraduate in music industry because I was interested in music, but I didn't have it down there. And I went to a trade school about recording. I, I, was a, I, was, I trained as a singer for a while, so I wanted to be these things. And then I said, well, design sounds kind of interesting. Music sounds kind of interesting. The, the, the idea of creativity and business sounds interesting. So I took that as music and business. So I took a music industry degree in Northeastern. But as I was there, I took a class called Innovation, which was a design thinking process. We, we looked at an industry. We did some research, qualitative research. We um, developed a product, developed a business model, and pitched it at the end of the class to a VC in Boston for, as, a, as, a thought, you know, as a thought experiment. Uh, and that process fascinated me. I was like, how can I do this, you know, keep going? But I still wanted to be in the music industry. So when I moved to New York, I was looking for a job and ended up getting a job where I'm at now at the Director's Guild. But I was like, what's a natural progression next? How can I do these innovative things and, and, and be an entrepreneur? Uh, you get an MBA, that's what you do, right? You, you become a business person and you change the world through business, but you actually make it kind of worse. So, I, I was going through the process of doing the applications for NYU and uh, Baruch and a few other schools over like a course of a year, because you have to take a GMAT. You might have to take the GRE, I took both. And on the GMAT, I did perfect in writing and horrible in math. In the GRE, I did great in math, but horrible in writing. So I was like, well, that's, that's my pattern, okay. So all of a sudden, I'm thinking, I still like this design thing. I'm, so I'm looking at design job, looking at these innovation jobs and, and pathways, it's like, and I found this new program of this crazy guy with this accent talking about it. And I'm like, holy crap, this sounds, this sounds awesome. And well, you called us androgynous at the beginning. So I said androgynous, which is the adult pedagogy. OK, sure. So anyway, um, so I, I find this program two weeks before the deadline of the application. This, I've been starting these applications in a, the MBA programs for six months, and they're still not complete. I find this program, and I complete it in two weeks. And I feel, well, I think this is what I need to do. And then I met you after I got in, and this is you, how we You had been trying to meet me before, but I was yeah. evasive. I still try to meet you, and you're still evasive. <laughs> We all try to meet you, JJ. You have to study his habits. You have to see where he's going to be. You I have keep to catch telling him. you, I am not the guru. <laughs> but OK, you don't want to believe it. This is, this is very significant, right? Everybody here has the turning point that's not traumatizing, but it's you really wanted to recreate your future at a very young age compared to you know most people at the age of 50 are wondering, why, why am I here? You know, what was I doing? I'm stuck with a 30-year mortgage, right? 30-year mortgage that's on average longer than a life sentence for murder, right? Um, uh, and I'm doing the same thing every day, and you did it very young. So what do you think your predisposition was before you found the program? Because this program was not one of the 1800 MBA programs where you run down the ASCSB accreditation list and you find it very easily. What was this predisposition at that time where you were searching for this and you thought, I'm qualified for this? What was catchy about it? Well, Shay, I was just thinking this before you even asked that question, is that um, I think the common thing is that as much as we were internally doing one thing and seeing it not line up with maybe our internal temperaments, I think there's an external understanding that we're all bringing into the game in that we've kind of, we've practiced and I think we've shown, it's since I've known everybody, it's, but it's, we understood what was going on in the world in that both the things we were doing or the rest of the ways you could go about learning, getting some kind of master's degree, um, doesn't necessarily cut it, right? And I've actually seen that more in my experience at this, uh, the consulting firm and how a lot of traditional business gets done, um, it's that if, if we can boil down the present environment, the present business context to just change is a constant. You know, not just in Mark's life, but like every company needs to stay ahead of that, right? And this design thing 
is the method by which that gets done, right? I think there's like a, a low level underlying understanding of that, that A, we all bring into it, and B, we understand we're gonna get closer to that, you know, understanding this method, this process, these mindsets to, um, to, to essentially stay ahead of the curve, right? And, and you, you were coming to it with, uh, intentionally, right? Uh, I think at your age, most people do an MBA more unintentionally, right? They just watch the crowd, who is doing what, let's mm -hmm. just go along, it must be a good thing, right? You were going against the stream. Um, I noticed that each one of you talked about culture and living in different cultures and being exposed to different cultures. Um, do you think that, that helped sharpen your instinct to look, to look for something more, more precisely, Leah? Yeah, I think um, living in a cross-cultural environment really helps you um, realize the value of different perspectives and, um, you know, different backgrounds and different values. And I think that we in this program are able to really take advantage of not only different cultures but also different backgrounds. We work with people that don't have the same background as us. We're not designers. Um, none of us have. Um, a very traditional background that would lead us here and yet we're all here and I think that we the reason why we found this is probably because we were all looking for a way to create meaning um, and to create meaning for the world that we live in today and I think that we all recognized um, that traditional paths don't really allow you to do that anymore unfortunately. Yeah, I, I think, um, agree. oh, you guys go. I tend to agree. I think, I think when you, a, a designer tends to look at things very differently, you know, and not just the graphic designer, web designer. A designer sees what pieces can come together or what pieces shouldn't be together. Um, and being ingrained in a culture and coming out of it and seeing different cultures helps you do that. And enables you to actually envision how things can be and how they shouldn't uh, in the context of organizations, in the context of society, in the context of this room. You know, we, how, how can we make this better? I think our stories kind of mesh in the sense that we found some, we find, we tend to see things and, and disagree with them and say like, well, this shouldn't be, I could design this so much better. We use the word design before we even be, came into this program. Mark, explain to us, as, as you're saying this now, at some point, uh, I remember you mentioning, you actually had to explain to your girlfriend because she thought it was bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. So uh, Hendrik was in the, in, the, in the audience today and a few others went to this uh, conference called Design and the Economy Equals Our Future, which was held by the International Federation of Interior Designers and Architects uh, about how can, we how can we integrate design into policy in the U.S. or in the Americas, namely. So I went to this thing and I was excited because it's like this is where I can be a d design nerd, an innovation nerd. And they put me in charge of this group called the Innovation. There were a bunch of different groups, innovation, public policy, health and wellness. And it was a think tank where in this scope, designers like me and architects and, and web design and journalists come together and talk about these things for the sake of creating a understanding of what design and policy in America is. So I, I, was, I was placed as the, what they called a provocateur to talk about my research. A difficult to, to inform. for you. <laughs> yeah to inform the group about what innovation is in a policy context. And we had done some in system innovation policy stuff in one of our classes, so I was able to do that. So this whole time, I'm like, yes, okay, we're talking about innovation, we're talking about networks, we're talking about systems, we're talking about society. And everybody in the room is agreeing with me, it's great, it's great. But we were all designers there, you know. And so I come home. Hey, you know, we, we, we talked about this over here, and it was by the International Federation of Interior Designers and Architects. You know, we're talking about design policy and the government and society. She's so like, well, why, why? Like, well, why, why did interior designers be concerned with that? It's like, well, because they're designers at heart, and, you know, design is a way to blah, 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 blah. It's like, but it doesn't sound like much. It, you know, it doesn't sound, what, what's the point, really? Uh, and it, it kind of made me think, like, you know, it, it's one thing as designers, we can talk about design all day. And I can talk about this stuff, and people in this room might, might understand what I'm talking about, but if we're talking about design and non-design context, that conversation needs to be had. We need to get people not in design to come to these things. We need to get people 
who work in the service industry, who work in fast food to come and, and see how it can improve their lives, not just in the process of serving food, but in the process of how they approach their job. You know, we need to, we need to in, this, in a sense, define what design, redefine what design is, and not just the design of things, but the design of processes, the design of thoughts, the design of interactions and systems, which makes it real for, for people who don't understand what this is. I think what inspired me to do this program was that um, it gave flexibility for one, because I needed that in my life at the moment. I was coming from a really stiff environment where I just was feeling suffocated. And so the ability for me to be able to continue my life and think about how I was going to do the change and do it from a distance and be able to come to New York and everything was really excited to me. And then the flexibility of um, mixing both worlds because I'm, I have a tendency to come from the creative side of things. I'm horrible with math and sometimes technology, but um, I love the, the fusion. Because, you know, um, especially after I took a studio class with Ria, we had this project and, and we really understood the importance of the holistic aspect of everything. So you can have a fantastic design, but if you don't understand how that design fits into a context and into a system, into um, a network, and how you can make it profitable, it's not going to work. And the same, the other way around, you can have a fantastic business system, but if you don't have a good product, it's not going to work. So that's what really started to inspire me about this uh, program. It was a fusion of both worlds that are usually separated, and we started seeing that we're complementary, actually, and that being from different backgrounds, like, you know, we had Andrea that's more systems, we have Alia that has her perspective from another culture, and Mark, and then we had other people that worked in NGOs. We had graphic designers, interior designers, and when we came into a group, it became really powerful, and I really understood, like, this is it, you know? We have to open up this conversation to other people. We have to bring in everybody, and that's when the interesting idea comes out. And that's what I really loved about this whole process, that we're so trained to be, like, pigeonholed into different things. You're, you're business, you're this, you're that, and if you're creative, then you don't mix with the business or with the other person, but that's not true, because the more you mix, the better, more holistic, and powerful idea, so. You know, y you cannot imagine how, uh, you know, I inside of me, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, at you and I'm, I'm so happy that you are now this happy person, right? You just spent 50,000 some dollars. Yeah. It was probably the most- make me happy. The most expensive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just reminded you. You make me happy, but not so, me. So, <laughs> so, 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 so we just, we just established that you just spent a huge amount of money to go to a transformation that probably in a one-on-one -on -one environment with a psychologist would have taken less time and would have been less costly, right? But your life changed, right? So you, you, ha you went through this program and you are all talking about your life change, not just uh, now I have a degree and I'm, 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 I'm going into, into new jobs. We also established that you're doing something new. You were, you were more or less guinea pigs, right, into something that didn't exist and that's still in the making. Y you are making it, right? You are, you're contributing. This is a very interesting upside down process. We didn't repackage something like a typical MBA program. We opened it up and you are constantly producing new cans of worms, right? And it seems like you're happy. Uh, you're not going like, you know, finally the whole thing is over, I will never go to school again, right? Um, now I have to start paying off my, my student loans. How awful was that, right? Um, that would be a first step, but I don't wanna well, hold you off here. You wanted to say something? I just, well, I sense where you're trying to get to, right? But, um, but I was just dying to say something about that thought okay. before about, um, which, which is actually just beginning to escape me. But, um, but I was saying earlier, if I'm, if I'm on this side of the spectrum, we were in this context, this, these classes with um, the rest of the spectrum, right? And I, I just remembered my first class getting in the room with um, one of my classmates, Chet. I don't know how many of you guys know Chet. He's the designer of all designers. He, m so artistic, so creative. His, his, his thoughts and his ideas 
seemed utterly ridiculous to me the first time I could ever I ever heard them. And my first my first inclination is there's no way that's going to work, right? I come I'm the practical. Is does it have a business case? Is it ever going to fit? Um, and I tell people this when I tell them the benefit of the program. I'm like, I think the biggest benefit is how A, I've been broadened, my mindset and my perspectives and my thinking, um, and how I've taken, both both learned to be open to that, but then learned to take that mentality itself. So, you know, I've assimilated it, um, kind of moved over in the spectrum. But, uh, but I got my job at Accenture. Um, relatively independent, almost in parallel to coming to this program. So they accepted me without knowing I was going to be like this after two yeah, years. He didn't even finish his first year. And, um, and, and, and if I thought I was on one end of the spectrum, the people I work with, um, it's a whole other thing to try to bring these things into that business environment. And as Mark said, people are somewhat talking about design. I think they get it if you frame it the correct way. And that's encouraging, but at the exact same time, people don't get it and people are resistant to, to change. And, um, and I think there's obviously a selection bias of the people in the room. You know, we were going through these um, quarter life crises and we were open to a program that we, we knew we were missing something and wanted to fill the gap. Um, but bringing it out to the rest of the world is, is the next challenge. Um, and exactly where you were positioning that question about we're gonna continue and take this and it's, um, We've almost learned how to continue to educate ourselves. So, so one way to bring it out to the world, right, besides your jobs, was this research class where you are producing a paper. And now what I encouraged you uh, to bring it out to the world, go to the Design Management Conference, uh, Design Management Institute Conference in, in London in September. And uh, I was running late, and I just didn't even ask you. I told you afterwards that I had to put in the paper, right? because there was a deadline, I put in the paper and then I'm like, two days later from, from Shanghai, I'm emailing them like, by the way, uh, we're going to a conference. And um, so you're bringing it out to the world. What is it that with your research you think you can demonstrate now? Because this is in very practical terms, right? Um, we just talked about the, the, the process and the attraction and uh, transformation, but tell us a little bit more about specifics of your research, and where, where in the program did, did, do you think you got the help, you got the motivation to do this? Because research does not come easy to people in school, right? A lot of it is really not research, it's look up, right? Like, let me go to Google and let me get inspired what I should be looking for. People don't have a specific question. And um, uh, over several sleepless nights, they squeeze out a paper, half as plagiarized, right? We have to run it to turn it in. Uh, that's not what happened to you. How did that happen? So for me, um, my topic came quite naturally to me because it was inspired by my learning experience. Um, I found myself having a transformational learning experience in this program and um, it was a conversation with you actually that got me to choose my topic because we were talking about learning and the future of learning and how um, the next generation would want to learn in order to be able to you know, live in the world that we live in and actually evolve. And, and what was on everybody's mind I think a, a year ago is MOOCs, right? Yes. Massive open online courses, yes. Coursera, edX, Udacity. Uh, it was like hot, 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 hot. Obviously, for those of you who are following that environment, uh, you know that a few weeks ago, uh, the proposal in California uh, that would have boosted the MOOCs uh, was shut down, right? And so things started cooling again a little bit, right? Because MOOCs are not going to be able to provide credit, et cetera, et cetera. So we were not doing this, right? I, I was talking to Aliyah and she's like, w w I, I feel, I sense something, there's something in that space, and we, we use the word MOOCs, and I said, but, but when you look at the program, we are the opposite, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. We are the anti-MOOCs, yeah. because if MBAs represent Wall Street, we are Occupy Wall Street. Right? So we had to do something with anti-MOOCs. Right, and it wasn't, it was about, I guess, using the design process to 
look at this challenge and frame it differently and really start a conversation. That was my only goal at the outset, um, was to start a conversation and to get us to look at these challenges from a different perspective. Um, I'm not an expert in education. I just had my experience to draw from. And, um, you know, I, I think that what we did and the best thing that we did was to start by stripping education to its essence, which is learning. So we weren't looking at education, we were looking at the learning experience. Perpetual change of yourself. Exactly. And, um, and then we started looking at how the next generation wants and needs to learn, um, and how does transformational learning happen? And ultimately, the priority there and, and the, the essence of learning is, is not, it's not about curriculums, it's not about schools, um, and it's not about e-learning. It's about people and the connections and, and how we learn from one another. So, so the delivery models, uh, our program is global, it's hybrid, it can be done online, on site, any mixture in between. We, we don't have a online track, an on-site track. People have at times moved from an online course after a few weeks into an on-site course. People that start in Abu Dhabi can move to New York in a semester and start taking them. So this context made it a little bit interesting for us. You know, we can do this with 40 people. We had 30 MS students and 10 graduate certificate students to start with. We can make this work with 40 students. Can we make this work with 400? How yeah. does one leverage learning when one has these, these modes of delivery uh, that one has to, to, to deliver on? And how did we make it work? How did so Google Plus? Google Plus, yeah. Um, and a lot, ingredient. a lot of positive attitude, I think, as well. Um, but I think throughout my process, what was very interesting is that obviously I was doing my um, qualitative research and doing a lot of reading and interviews, but I was also going through a transformational learning experience which really inspired the output. Um, I found myself getting a lot of value from you and from my other professors, um, from my fellow students as well, a lot. And I also found myself mentoring um, first year students and helping out some of my fellow students on some things that um, I had spoken to you about. And I found that that answered my question. How do we scale this? How do we make this more accessible? Well, we're vehicles to this knowledge. And it's not, it's not a linear uh, network that we need. It's a distributed network that's flexible and that enables us and empowers us to share all this knowledge. And naturally, um, I found, and I think everyone knows this, the next generation are social learners. So they're predisposed to do this quite naturally. You know, I'm just going to share uh, in extension to what, what Yali is saying. When I was doing my Carnegie Mellon degree in software engineering, I was doing it online. I was doing it from New York, right? And I had a studio course that was online. And I had this professor who was, I, I, I would want to use the word amazing, but also mix that with super hard ass. He was somebody who had crashed three F-14s in his life, who was writing software to not crash F-14s anymore. <laughs> and on, he, on t t Tuesdays, I had even several months after I finished my degree, I had a stigma of Tuesday night because I had to connect to him and I was never prepared. And I was, you know, two, two times I got out by like, I'm not feeling so well. Uh, another time I had a meeting and And here's what happened between Monica and I. Monica would come online and she would be like, <sighs> and then it took me two hours to tranquilo, tranquilo, right? And then she was like, after us, this is all good now. I'm, f I'm feeling so much better, right? Like that, that effect, I, I think, 
I appreciated that that effect kept kept transpiring. That's what I was missing in my education online, but creating that effect where you are encouraged to go on rather than like, boy, I got this one done, so now I have 167 hours until the next thing happens, right? What? One of the, uh, well, I'll just say this real fast, is that I think one of the biggest things about Aaliyah's story and experience is that she was in it, doing it, literally this program in just the new ways, and then she was took a project on it, and so then she was working with it, and she was designing it as she's in it. And, and that's my story, that's my experience in the sense of I was doing two parallel activities which were both taking up you know, full time between working at a consultancy and school here, and, and the, the, the thought was, how do we bridge this gap, right? We have consultancies that deliver value, kind of industrially, reliably, they get it, they get it there, people pay for it, and then you have design in us that does it on maybe a smaller scale, but it's more transformative, and there has to be a way that, like, that's, that's how you put it to me that I remember the conversation distinctly. It's like, there's a gap there. One's large scale, um, but smaller increments. One is bigger increments, but small scale. What's it look like? And that's what's like, that's what I wanted, that's what I want to figure out. It's like, there has to be a way to do what we're doing on a larger scale, and to think about um, how we design the pieces of an org, either services or the organization itself, to be able to, to do this for companies, either for, from a consultancy perspective or from the kind of entrepreneurial in, industry perspective, and, and bring that design to it. What does it look like to do the entire universe of what business is now from a design perspective? So. John had to hone me in, it was pretty lofty. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and I think it has, it's very powerful. I think it's one of the powerful things about qualitative research in itself. Um, how long does it take to be an expert in education? Try 20 years, 10, 600 years. courses, and I still feel horrible. Right. And Horribly and, unprepared. Right, and, and the effects of that, we have SATs, we have you know, tests that don't really test what people are capable of. The thing about, interesting about your research is very qualitative, and it's, it, it, the qualitative brings the color to the numbers, right? And what, what I see is that we may not be experts in education, but we know what it's like to be a student for 20 years, more than 20 years, right? People who are still students, that the qualitative aspect of knowing how it feels to be in a learning environment is not tapped into, and this really taps into it, which is, the, is what can bring it to a large scale thing understand how people feel when they're students, and you can design a system to enhance that, to better it, or to bring it out in a different way. And, and with qualitative research, where you have to bring in all this, all this subjective, right? You can't really fake it. Remember, quantitative research, when you work with numbers, and you have this pressure to produce results, num numbers are like people, if you beat them up long enough, eventually they will tell you what you want to hear. Right? But if you do it with qualitative research, ethnographic or grounded theory, zigzag method of interviewing or a case study like what I proposed to, to Andrew, I said, why don't you compare this to, for example, uh, Deloitte Touche or, or the other uh, Cooper's Librand who, uh, the three consulting firms that are now grasping desperately to, to get this rolling because uh, it's, it's just, just looking at the Amazon website and typing in design thinking, right, and getting those 785 titles that have been published in the last 24 months, right? This is hot, this, this is really uh, getting traction, right? And so uh, taking well, all of these aspects in, you couldn't fake it, right? Yeah, and I think one of the things about that qualitative research that's just necessary is, is if we're designing systems, which in the end we all were, so we all had lofty big, big ideas, right? We weren't just designing a thing, per se, we were building a system. So if I'm thinking about organizations, um, and Elias thinking about education, and I say organizations like for-profit companies versus the whole educational system, right? You can't get at a system qualitatively. And maybe you can measure it, but you can't prescribe it, right? And so that's the key of it. So you either need to um, take enough theory and then rework it, or get it yourself and get in the field and understand the people, take it. or another huge one is take from our own experiences, right? And so it's just absolutely vital for the purpose of what we're doing in the sense of building this thing. And I, th I think we all understand that, right? Like 
design itself is a inference to the best thing that doesn't exist yet. Um, so if I make the context that is attractive enough and I can hold that context, then things will happen, right? It's a little bit Steve Jobs-like. It's a little bit Apple-like when Steve Jobs were on, creating the context, the conversation, the discourse, and all of a sudden you had, you know, create the eye, and you can soon sell eye shit in a jar, right? Eye shit to all. Uh, because you can throw into that context many different things for quite some time, even with an incompetent CEO, right? You can continue throwing things into that. That's, that's culture, that's, that's cult, cultish culture. Um, you should stop describing my research. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's, that's interesting, right? You create the context rather than, than chiseling on that, on that product until you think you got all the features right. Um, I think for me, um, which is very much to it, Ali is speaking about her project that I guess happened to all of us, is that um, this program was disruptive and I think is disruptive in the way that it functions and in my life because even though I went to quite a progressive school, it's like we're taught, okay, this is the research, this is the topic, you're gonna do it, and that's why he caused me a lot of anxiety because he's like, okay, you guys gotta do this research and then I couldn't find him for like a month and a half. I'm like, where is this man? Like, what are we supposed to do? And me and Ali would talk like, do you know what we're doing? No. And then slowly, I just started tinkering and being like, okay, well, what is it that you're passionate about? Just do that, you know, because that's what you're gonna be able to do the best. And then I started talking to JJ and we got into this really interesting conversations. And then what I'm taking out of this whole thing that's been really enlightening for me, um, that it has come full circle, and that we learn about this process, but I learned it for my life. And uh, I learned that you have to enjoy that process, that you have to be present in it and not be focused on what is it that's gonna be about. You know, he's just like, go do it, go find the people. And how it happened to me is like I was organizing a TED Talk in Rome and it was about inspiration. And then one of the speakers was this woman that was the first person that was my aha moment because she finished her speech and I run to the stage. I'm like, oh my God, you're talking just about what I need. And it was just really organic. So it's just because of getting in that mindset of being in the moment, of being enjoying that process, that's, that's how I was able to find what I needed to find. And then from her, she led me to another person and to another person. She led me to the woman that I'm working with, this artisan in Rome that makes this really beautiful fabrics that I'm working with now, that now we're gonna do something together with a person I met here in New York. And it's just all connects. And before, I guess I did this program and understood this really in a deep level, I didn't know that. And we're taught very much to be like, you have to do research because you have to have 30 pages written by May 3rd and you have to turn it in and that's it. But it wasn't about that, it was like about meeting Andrew and, and getting here this semester with Jerome. I started this with JJ and now with Jerome it continued and it evolved into something else and once I called Andrew and said, Andrew, I don't know where JJ is, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to start it, please help me. And he totally had a conversation with me and you know, he was like really organized. I'm like, oh my God, here we go. Like, thank you. And then I talked to Ali and it was just like, all that we learned, I was doing. Like the collaboration, the process, the this, mm -hmm. it just all kind of happened. And that's cause, cause I spent my whole education, which is those 20 years of my life, putting papers together, this, this systematic way of thinking. And so, A, there was a gap and we, we filled it. And the other side of it is that, um, as much as we are being academic and we're thinking high level and, and putting these systems together, the other side of the design process is, is you know, you go wide and then you come down and you make it really tangible and really practical. And that's exactly what you're saying. It's not only am I going for what I'm passionate about and understanding how to write this paper, but then you're gonna get it done and you're meeting people here, 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 and you're connecting the dots. And actually this was like the best, the, the, the pedagogy of this year was to, to think theoretically and put our theses together, but then to have a studio class and to take it and run with it. And I think all of us are doing that in, in some sense. And over the year we've done the, we went broad and then we brought it down. And that's, that's what I know, I think at least the three of us are um, taking our learnings and 
working them out, which is that iterative process. So it's a little meta to think that our education is following the design process as we learn the design process mm -hmm. and utilize the design process. But um, again, that, that's what it is. That's the gap that I needed. I needed to get grounded and get my hands dirty. Um, and Monica needed to, to get, figure Talk out how to, to do that, Andrew do that to paper, be you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that's the kind of the story of, of the things we were missing and we found and the way, and it, it's the way that, I mean, I'm convinced, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, that this is the way to go about um, whether you're designing an educational system, something not for profit or, or something within a business context to, um, again, what's that thing we need to do? We need to, to stay ahead, whether it's, whether we call it innovation, whether we call it just profits, we need to, um, if you stand still, you're gonna, you're gonna lose in whatever thing, whatever thing. I think, to be. I think it all relates back to leadership, that thing that doesn't necessarily connect to a person, but a, but a concept of leadership. So the leadership context is kind of what we tout around here that the point of, of being a leader is to make other leaders. So like in, in class we have group work and group work in itself is hectic and chaotic, which is a part of the process, but it enables you to find leader, leadership opportunity at the smallest level. So like one of, my, one of my classmates who's here, I won't mention him, but I'll look at him right now, uh, we, we worked in a group and he's like, you know, these people, they just, they just don't get it. And you know, we, we put together the framework and all you have to do is do the work. All you gotta do is do the work but they're not doing it and they just don't have any, any drive. And I say, I say you know, guy, um, <laughs> because you see that, you need to be the leader. The, the, the fact that you see and you recognize and you see the pieces coming together and, and what people could do means that you have to show leadership in this moment. And I think that that can, can breed to other contexts, even, even in the intangible and the research. Like I'm, I'm using this research that I'm doing to lead myself to create my own job, to to create a, a mastery of a certain topic so that it can create other people to, to stem off that research. So the difference to some more traditional programs compared to this program and then what you get at Parsons, what you get at the new school, is the difference that, you, you know, my perception of MBAs, I've taught in MBAs for, for a long time, is you get stuck in the analytical, right? And and here, the analytical is, it's, it's understood. We, we need to do that, but then we go and we have the courage to become generative. What, what gave you the courage to become generative about those things? To, to I, move it, you know, because analytical means critique yeah. and being critical and I, saying I what doesn't work. What, what happens is that when you become very analytical about something, you're in a sense leading the question. You're saying this should be changed because this thing is wrong. Like, well, maybe that's not exactly the way. So for me, I come from Northeastern University where I studied music industry and Northeastern was a place that uh, Napster started, like Sean Parker started out of his dorm room. And I kind of always had in the back of my head, like, you know, it's possible because I engaged in file sharing, um, <laughs> rapid file sharing, but the you know, legal, the, it's, illegal it's, kind, it's right? illegal, but it's a, an amazing way to share information. That's what it is. It's not illegal in a general context. It's just sharing information, whether it's protected or not. So I was thinking, well, you know, I need to understand why this is happening and why people are mainly the contract distributors and licensors are concerned with protecting it so much when at least innovation, you know, they just need to be able to see it. But what I'm doing there is like, I'm leading the question, you know, I'm very, being very analytical and I'm saying this is the reason why it doesn't work and I see how it can work, so just do it. That's not the way to do it. So instead, I took a more qualitative approach and I talked to Robert, you know, I kind of gave him this thing, you know, people are stealing music, but it's not really stealing and companies are protecting it and maybe they shouldn't. It's like, well, you're, Leading the question, you know, be more general. Uh, understand why why people feel they need to to take the music, or or why companies feel they need to protect it. And I could lead it with that question, but I could that's still kind of kind of answering my own question. So instead, I, I, I my research was focused on um, why do you interact with your tablet, computer, and streaming video? Like why is that a, a, an experience you have in your life? Which brings out interesting insights into how they feel when they're watching, how the experience of always being connected all the time, ubiquitous computing. Omnipresence yeah, instead. Yeah, so I framed it as omnip omnipresent access to streaming video. You know, you, there's probably somebody in this room right now watching Breaking Bad, you know, but it's, it's not, it's always there and it's changing our lives. It, it's, it's putting us into a context where we're not bound by schedules. Uh, we can be more social with it or not social with it. It can be our little secret. Um, and those little insights are the, 
the stem or the seed to innovation? So, uh, four research teams completely different. I tried to carry three of those uh, at the same time, right? Getting confronted with questions on the weekend that I wasn't prepared for, but I had to think and and I appreciate that you guys waking up at six in the morning. I, I, I need right, my coffee. Because it was it was noon in Rome, right? <laughs> but here's the thing, right? Now now if you're here, uh, maker movement um, uh, the idea of of the design centric organization, uh, the, the antecedents to, to moving a large organization into the design centered thinking world. Um, the anti MOOCs, uh, omnipresence. Um, I'm not going to hide the agenda behind a lot of the uh, a lot of the obvious verbiage of the program, but the agenda was moving away from social entrepreneurship because of its limitations. Right, creating social value with private means, essentially because we were giving up on government, right? We were giving up on who actually should be in charge of creating social value and the infrastructure. And, and the methods uh, that we have is, you know, make rich people guilty or feel guilty, uh, donations, charities, etc. That's a very limiting environment. It was hot for a while. It sounded good, but I think we recognize the limits. It's, it's political. If you want to make anything a little bit bigger, you're going to end up either in in the mayor's office, which I have a company that is doing that, we are consulting with the mayor's office, or you're gonna end up in Albany and you could end up in jail, right? Anybody who ends up in Albany. Or you could end up in the federal government um, in, in Washington and would have to fight a big fight, right? So, so that's limiting to me. So my agenda was, if I'm proposing this, this program where we are fusing business uh, logic and design thinking to create design intelligence, was to take it to that level that you guys all took it, because each one of your areas, you don't even, you, you may at this point not know it yet, but it's, it's driving you to think about how to create private economic value with social means, right? the, the, the uh, Amazons of the world, the Facebooks of the world, the Twitters of the world have done this and, and we want to know how do we replicate this because this is, where, this is where our future lies. The governance of this environment so that we don't end up yet with another case of the internet that's 80% porn, right? Um, do you feel that the program delivered to you that that aspect of becoming the cadre, the the people that will provide some of that governance from within your organizations, not not as disgruntled employers by showing your your boss the finger because you have a new degree and you can go somewhere else, but but driving this responsibility, right, that you were talking about. If you know that it is that you have to take responsibility and you have to contribute, right? Well, so that goes in line with just the idea that we've all had our horizons broadened, right? We've all had our perspectives expanded. And let's say you're that traditional employee and you're there for a paycheck and you're there to deliver on, on goals, right? That's again, pretty narrow. And I think, at, le at least I've come to see this, that um, these employees are people, the company itself, as it relates to its employees and to customers, right? Or all any other stakeholder um, within it. It's, uh, as we're designing for these people and these systems and these things, or whether it's students and teachers, right? It's we see beyond just the, the dollars and cents, right? So as much as we're taking design, which may not have been um, commercial, right, economic, and understanding it in the whole context, we're also going the other way out, right? And instead of thinking, so I'm kind of just reiterating your point that instead of thinking about a business as a business and the people as these employees, it's the whole thing, right? And so you have to take that, you have to take that social perspective, and actually. Um, maybe not in the direct way, but a roundabout way, as I was looking at what it means to be a design-centric firm, right, as a large company, um, what would it be to design a company like this? And it's thinking, spoiler, the answer is the people, right? Um, as you're doing organizational design, maybe big D design, thinking about making this company the right way, the right way to A, stay ahead of this change, but, but then how do you do that? So if that's the economic sense, but we have our horizons broadened, we're going to think about all the other implications and all the other outputs. And that's the people, right? And the people are going to, A, get you there, 
but B, it's that community of people, whether they're internal or external, that are A, gonna get you there, and B, are your stakeholders. So the way I've come to see that in my research is that um, the company itself, as you're building it, you're going to think beyond whatever dollars and cents and productivity to them as whole people, your customers as whole people, your reach as a community and a network, and the whole thing relationally. And that's gonna get you, I mean, it's social value that maybe we don't talk too much about, but that's like the fabric of society. That's, mm -hmm. um, you know, Robert Putnam, that's social currency, right? Those are huge things that we're, um, that we can, that I think, I think are drastically important that we're building, that we can see now. At least I was broadened into seeing that um, perspective. That makes me think of a course I took with one of my favorite teachers and I see you, Professor Press. Hello. I'm excited to meet you in person finally, but I did this project um, once in his course with uh, Marianne and Victor and me. I think we, and what I loved about um, Professor Press' class was that he really made us think about where does a disruption come? Why is a company amazing? You know, look at where the innovation happens and how can you recreate this and recreate this and recreate this again and again and again. And we did this project on Virgin and it just made me think what you were talking about, Andrew, that was like, um, this company is amazing and it provides great services, but it's amazing because, you know, Richard Branson really started understanding that it's about the people and it's about his employees. People have fun, like everybody's kind of going to play and everything he designed around it is to play and when people take the airline, it, they also feel like they're playing, they're having fun, everybody's happy, so that's what they project and that's how they connect. So it's all taking it down to that human level and that's why he's so successful because he understood it's not about, you know, having the fastest plane or whatever, it's about making people feel good at every touch point when they come to Virgin, it's like, we pick you up, we get out of the car, you have this amazing fun lo lounge where they have like all these cool things. And when I took that class, it was really enlightening because for the whole semester, um, you know, Professor Press was always making us look at these things, you know, like, why is this company amazing? Where is innovation happening and why? You know, and there's, you know, we looked at different, uh, we did, several different projects, but I just remember this one in particular that was really impactful to me because I'm like, okay, I had a click. I'm like, this is it, you know, and this is how we have to start thinking for the future because that's what consumers now want. You know, we have changed and this is what we're looking for. We're looking not for just a product that's been manufactured in a factory and done like, you know, mass produced. We're looking for a connection. We're looking for a story. We're looking for like, yeah, I remember that person in Virgin that talked to me and cracked a joke. That's what you're going to connect with. The overall yeah. experience of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost insulting, in a sense, <laughs> to think that things have been designed without people in mind. You know, we have to put names on things like human-centered design, user experience, user research. Who to, else to was bring, it designed for? To bring, yeah, <laughs> right. to bring, bring people back into the conversation that the Industrial Revolution made a thing that, you know, making things is the most important. And then we need to design schools around that. People hear the bell just like in a factory. You know, people die in factories, of course, because it's made with big machinery that's dangerous around people. Um, bringing people back into the conversation is, is not a special thing. It's just reality. You know, we call it human-centered design, but it's just, obvious. it's just reality. And when you don't do that, bad things happen. Now, can I? At this point, right, because it's quarter to 12, and uh, many of you have a uh, latent motivation here of the free lunch that's being uh, put out there, right? So uh, not holding you hostage uh, uh, too long. Should we introduce 15 minutes and have the audience ask us questions? And we can, re we can respond to that. And it's, it's beautiful because there's only like uh, 148 of you, so uh, not too many, right? Um, I'm just saying that for the for the recording, right? <laughs> um, there's a microphone right there, uh, but I think it's in the wrong place. So I'm gonna take that microphone over here on the other side, and why don't you come up to the microphone if you wanna ask those um, four uh, questions? Now, after lunch uh, at one o'clock, Joseph 
press uh, will then do what we do, which is um, creating logos from chaos, right? We start with chaos, we acknowledge the chaos, we are generative, not just analytical, because you can be analysis paralysis in chaos, right? And uh, Joseph will then summarize this and put this into a format uh, and prep us for our exercise in the afternoon, where we will have, again, a lot of fun. Um, but before we go there, uh, if there are questions, and I'm thinking that there's so few of us that you should, so sure, you right yeah. Oh, you just have to turn it on? Okay. All right. I'm, Ro I'm Robert okay. Levitt. I'm relatively new to the new school. John recruited me in a big rush about two weeks after a course began. So you can both look at So I'm still look at using, uh, I'm still learning the technology. I'm still learning your attitudes. I'm still learning about your feelings. We also have something in common. Uh, John and I are both five foot four. We both wanted to be rock singers. We both couldn't do that. Uh, I went into business and academics. He went into academics. And we've just started to learn to play the guitar together again. So And we are both 27. Yes, I just yes. I just, I just had my 24th, 27th birthday. Which one well, was I, I, I'd have to say I was 29 then. But uh, So I, I actually challenge you to the next time we do something like this, maybe we can actually embarrass ourselves in some way trying to play the guitar. John tried to. He uh, ran out of time. <laughs> One of the things I've learned, though, in trying to play the guitar is there are ways of learning, and there are different ways of learning. And we talked about it's very hard to be an expert in learning. And one of the first things I did when I got my guitar, which looks a lot like that, was go to guitar school, where they were teaching me the analytics. They were giving me basic facts of scales and constructing things, never giving me the vision of playing uh, you know, the House of the Rising Sun or, or Green Sleeves or something that I was trying to do. My feeling is that the things we're talking about in this curriculum are sort of like that. They are changing the world. They are transformative. And you can't necessarily transform with total analytics. A lot of education is teaching us how to give you facts and combining them and then saying, once you combine them, you have this, it's socially acceptable, it's presentable, it's publishable. So I have a single question that is really something I'm thinking about, and you could very much help me. Are we using the right methods in our courses? Are you experiencing knowledge in a transformational way? And if you are, what does that say about your feedback to us in terms of the new methods we might use to help you do that? I love that thought because because I've seen it right in the 20 years of school before this school. So, <laughs> exactly um, that that accepted knowledge is is built up, right? Whereas transformational knowledge is a leap, and then you have to. And this was like my mind blowing understanding about design is that you you make a leap, and it's crazy and it's forward thinking. It would change things. And people go, No, you're never going to do that. And you say, Well, let me try. And then you iterate to it, right? That's why, that's how the whole thing kind of starts to make sense and become powerful, because you can get there. Whereas if I have to build slowly on top of knowledge, on top of knowledge, I'm never even gonna get there. In fact, I'm gonna get over here, it's gonna be much worse, it's not gonna be the ideal, right? So thinking about are we getting there, I think, well, I think the way, so I think you're, you said two things, or I'm gonna jive with two things, is that one, it's, it's the leadership, or it's the, Mark was talking about leadership, but it's the, um, you, you, you can't analyze your way to it. You need to be kind of pushed and, and told the, the end game. So this is learning that song. I think that's exactly it. And I think we are there in a lot of ways. I think we might get, um, I think as we were driving and figure out are we teaching skills and tools versus a mindset, I think it's that mindset of um, think think forward and then, and then make it happen, right? Um, I know, I, actually, I feel like our studios have done a very good job of, of, drawing, of finding that balance because whenever someone thinks too small, they get pushed ahead, right? And then whenever someone thinks properly big, they get helped along to it. Um, so I think, it's, I think it is about that vision. And um, I, don't, I, don't, I think Mark is about to give an example, which is awesome. Well, analytics means you have something to measure. You have a data set, you can, you can look at different things and create statistics out of it and 
depending on where you stand, whether you're trying to inform or, or, or be against it, you know, that's, it, can, it can be misstrued. But the qualitative research is important because you take it as it is, right? And then you develop mm -hmm. themes out of it to understand what happens. And this is creating new knowledge. I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you look at education in itself, you know, whatever field you're in, it stems back to something. It always goes back to something. Who was the first guy who created this theory? Where did he get it from? They always have, the, that's why you see references. It always stems from knowledge that has been created. So if you're, if you're in a classroom reading a book and taking a test, you're, you're just being complacent to that knowledge and saying that in this market, whatever it is, this will work, so do it. You know, the studio puts us into the realm of let's try it out. I'm working with a small company here that's a uh, fitness fusion business that does also workshops in schools and uh, uh, classes and um, dance parties, right? And they had the idea of wanting to innovate in their market. Uh, so, I, so, I, so I could go and be someone, okay, other fitness groups have done this and, and you know, other business groups and dance groups have done this. But I had to get a sense of who they are first. And it turns out it's very, very disorganized. So you can't, you can't, I don't have anything in the measure because everything's changing so quick. So I have to be very qualitative, like, well, change your interactions and let's try this out. You having a party, try this this way, you know, and, and you measure in a very ethnographic sense. You look at uh, what's not being done, you know, the things that you can't measure may be the more important thing. And to Robert's question, right, do you think that Every, everybody who is teaching in this program is, first of all, special. Not because they are highly published, and, and some of them are, but it's because they're friends. We share the vision. This is not about faculty and instructors and, and resources, right? This is about, I invited you because I know you would enjoy this. It would be a intellectually stimulating environment for you. I would otherwise not have Right? I don't need people to perform a job. And I need to say about Robert, right? This is a astronaut who failed the physical test, as you can see. Right? <laughs> but, but, but has a PhD in psychology um, and is teaching the research class. And do you think that that predisposition makes him exactly because of that valuable? I think what I found fascinating about this program was um, the direct connection we had with uh, professionals. So in my previous education, my undergrad, it was I had amazing teachers, but they're academics. And here, you know, we had Rhea, we had Jerome, we had Professor Press, and I felt like I was actually talking like as I was going to a meeting to Delight or to IDEA or to Rhea's company, you know, because they're coming with that direct knowledge and they're helping me connect my ideas with that knowledge, and they're helping me go forward, you know, and um, the studio that I'm doing here, my last uh, project um, that I'm doing with Jerome has been really enlightening because I came with this research, which I learned to do, you know, by throwing, being thrown in the pool from the dive board, like, okay, go, and I just said, okay, I'm going to jump, and I learned that whole process, which was really cool, so I came with this huge body of information, and then I took it to this class, and I remember, you know, it's really nice for me to feel how I feel now. And the first day when I came to Jerome, I feel like everybody was so much more prepared. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, Jerome. I just know that I want to do, I love this artisans. I'm really passionate about it. I'm sad because, you know, I feel like their products are disappearing, but that's all I know. He's like, okay, don't worry. Let's brainstorm, let's see. And then slowly it started again. But it's like the whole circle, because I used everything I used with John in my paper, and now I came around in a more tangible way. And that's what I really appreciated about this, like having that space to just go through the process. And I would have conversations with Jerome, and he would never do good or bad or whatever. He's like, OK, this is interesting. Go explore. And then more and more. So, so we don't really know what those tools are, right? But we yeah. know that we are doing something to create that space. Maybe we have to look back and identify what those tools are. Um, yeah, I, would, I would encourage you to do that. One of the things, if you could compare and contrast this program to other programs, you mentioned the analytic, for instance, in the MBA. 
the language is different, the feeling is different, the experience is different, but as teachers, we tend to gravitate to the same old tools. We give you readings, we give you papers, you do PowerPoint presentations. And what I'm beginning to look is, is you know, workshops aside, and I'm still a novice at what workshops mean, they seem like projects to me, but are there other tools we could be using? I, I think you came close by saying- I think we've leaking, had you know, both. Like, yeah. um, we've had information and, you know, a more traditional way, you know, we've had articles, we've had readings, we had whatever, but we've also had the space to go explore um, by doing. And that's the best way to learn, you know? We, we created a space in which you tried and maybe you failed and it was okay because we had a group to support us. We had people in the industry with knowledge to be like, okay, maybe we should try it this way. Or we talked to our fellow students and they know more or less about a certain industry and then we can get that feedback, I so. Think, yeah, I think the word action comes to mind that we iterate, we explore, we iterate, and then we act. Uh, storytelling is really important. Um, a lot of programs um, in this field tout the design thinking process and what it can do and everything, but there may not be as much storytelling in it. And storytelling brings it back to human nature of, of how we, it connects, whether it's design or innovation or whatever. One thing that I will say that's working right now that Ray has been working on for a while is this initiative to understand that what context we are in in this program that will be uh, delivered in, in, the, in the near future that I won't speak on much now, but it's about storytelling. It's about the creative um, expo exploration of business and design. It's about a doer. It's about a strategic, strategic thinking that a lot of programs uh, don't focus on. And you know, it's more about I'm this person. I'm this person that's doing this research and I'm acting on it and I'm creating something out of it, whether it's a design consultancy or, or a design-centric firm or whatever. The fact that we can practice what we preach in this program is very, very strong here. And, and, I, and I know what, what, what Robert is talking about is how do we displace or replace the transmission type of teaching that we did for so long, right? And that's easy for us to do. I tell you what, it's not easy. I barely handle 10 students uh, because the amount of thinking, and I'm not saying time, right? But the amount of thinking that I did during the research course with, with those people, which was a benefit to me, and I, I know what we have to consider, right? As we grow to double the size, triple the size, Robert is saying, you know, how are we gonna get this faculty to stop accounting for the time because everybody in this program is putting way more time than they would ever put in teaching for a three credit course. And so how does this, this, this time effort get, get translated? And I would caution against standardization of any kind. I, I wanna keep it young and I wanna keep us clumsy about this and discovering mm -hmm. new ways of doing it because you don't discover those tools immediately. It'll take some time. This is new. We are still designing it, right? We are still creating it. But I think right now it's like, for me, I didn't account for the time because my passion was just overwhelming the time uh, uh, amount, right? I think it's what worked for most of the success, most successful classes was the flexibility. So it wasn't about setting a time. Everybody has to meet at this time. And this is when you have to turn in the homework, whatever. It's like everybody, you know, I was in Rome. Ali was in Abu Dhabi. Obviously, we can't meet at the same time as people in New York. So, but what mattered was uh, the time that we did get with, you know, when I spoke to Ria alone and we had a conversation, when I spoke to Jerome and my time and his time when he was ready to, you know, share with me and I could do it. So I didn't have the stress like, oh my God, I have to make it at this time and I'm never going to get to talk to the teacher or with JJ, we figured out our system for us to work. And so I think that's how we managed to and, make and it work. You, and you created that system, right? It's mm -hmm. not the teacher who tells you when they are available. Uh, you learned how to manage me because you sure, you made damn sure that if you couldn't find me for six weeks, at that point, you just had me there for three hours. I rang you every day. <laughs> So, so that was very fascinating. Everybody learned how to create that space for themselves with the, 
with the, let's call it, uh, instructor. Uh, the word teacher here is very misplaced, Every right? teacher, ha like Professor Press, we had a time, and it just kind of worked, and if somebody couldn't come, we would record it, and they could listen to it, so they could come next time. I think flexibility is really important because we're all working. Most of the students in this program, I don't think there's anyone in our group that wasn't a professional. Plus, being a full-time student, some people are parents, so you, it's kind of unrealistic to tell somebody, you have to be here at this time right now and that's it or you won't get anything out of it. So I think it's kind of like a matter of working out with your colleagues and with the teachers when you have the space and time to make it work for you. Uh, you, you mentioned some our parents, right? Maka is one of our students. She's in uh, Miami and uh, one of your friends, right? And uh, we would have disappointment on Sunday morning and I would get an email or I would get a text. I'm still feeding the baby. So I had to wait until the baby was fed and then she would go look at the baby, talk to the baby for a few minutes. And then we started our session. And uh, um, uh, those are the, the little moments where, where you realize uh, how you're making it work. I would just add one more thing to what everyone said. I think one thing that was very important to me in this program is that I feel empowered now to um, not only work within systems and contexts, but to create whatever contexts I think is necessary for the particular situation. And it's, it's not about learning skills, and it's not about information. Mm. We all have access to information today. It's, it's about what you do with it and how proactive you can be and how you kind of have this open attitude towards the future and how you approach it and how you can change things, really change things. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you again. All right. And I would say a lot of the students do a lot more outside of class than in class. Class time is kind of just to talk about what we did over the week, the weekend when we were doing studio with Rhea. I mean, I was at the site doing ethnographic research. Um, other people were doing workshops in different organizations, talking to people in the street, going to hang around Compost and Union Square. And these are the things that we did and then talked about in studio. In minus so. 12. So, so, minus <laughs> yeah. so, so, so <laughs> class time from now on will be relabeled, check in. But right. I think the thing that's also interesting is like for me at least, I don't know for everybody, yeah. and I think kind of because we're living, we're talking or walking the talk, yeah. it's like, all of a sudden, my, my mind click, and I started living this, you know? So I was telling Jerome the other day, it's like, everybody I'm, I'm talking to, I like click, I'm like, oh my god, okay, they're telling me something, like, look, I can connect this to my research. Like, it just started becoming, like, in my mind, this is what I think about. This is, like, it became the thing, you know? And I started listening in a different way where everybody had something interesting to say, even if I didn't ask them, like, oh, do you believe in the maker movement, or do you think of this about artisans? But then something started clicking and connecting and I found that so fascinating because I could be talking to, I don't know, the person that sweeps the street and then I got something, I'm like, oh, look, this is a really interesting insight where I wasn't thinking like that before. Now, we need some calories, right? <laughs> because uh, all this brain matter that uh, consumed all the sugar. Uh, thank you very much, uh, thank you and in the audience, it's 12 o'clock, uh, come back at 1 o'clock for, uh, I think this is the best way to do this, right? This is the cleanest environment, the least noisiest environment, so that Joseph will um, uh, do his keynote speech. Uh, at 2 o'clock then we will start our uh, life design challenge. To those people who are watching us on uh, streaming, uh, we will now have some wonderful, wonderful, expensive food. Uh, you guys should salivate about this. Uh, I wish you were here. And we will reconvene in an hour and uh, start re-recording, right? Is that good for everybody? Sounds great. All right. Thanks Thank a lot. you.